welcome Jeremy and Matt Tierney of the Raptors on the stage. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Man, people that showed a, up. That was a long bio. Was, I'm so sorry. All right. I was just pointing out to Matt, like, he has this really awesome, like, headshot photo, super real, and then there's me, and I'm just, like, posing like an idiot, which is always... always I'm just glad I had hair there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hang on to that even yeah. when I'm, like, 50. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, how do we kick this off? I have no idea. I feel like we're speaking like we're... Where we're hosting something. I don't even know what time zone I'm in right now. I know because so. you just you just got off uh, a, a quite hectic plane from from LA. Right? Yeah, I had, uh, yeah, I had like a, a meet the parents moment. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about just trying to rush through and try not to body check old ladies as I was trying to make it on time because they were saying it, we ha we may have to cancel the session. So um, <clears throat> uh, big shout out to Leo Routens. Uh, I don't know if you guys know him. He's one of the commentators for the Raptors. So I travel with him. Um, and he managed to stick by and pick up my bag uh, while I rushed out of the airport, uh, to which then I just got a text from him saying that they lost my bag. So um, <laughs> I may not be going to work tomorrow. So, so let's maybe let's kick off, like share a, a little bit what you, what you do with MLSC sure. and the Raptors, uh, the scope of your role. I mean, so <clears throat> Jeremy and I, uh, I spoke on a panel that uh, Jeremy had moderated uh, a few years ago now. Yeah, well, we met in kindergarten, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Best buds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the time, my role was uh, a community manager for the Toronto Raptors, which essentially was a title, but it encompassed whatever, you know, I wanted to make that role um, because, you know, kind of the role of content curation um, and storytelling is, it only goes so far as the effort that you put into it, right, and what you want to do with it. So um, I was, you know, Long story short, running the Toronto Raptors accounts full time, every single social media account, writing articles, posting them online, generating content, doing as much as I could, um, and realized that uh, that added a whole lot of uh, white hairs in my beard and a whole lot less hair, and I probably need some help. Um, so, so a couple years ago, um, we had hired. Uh, a kid named Sohil Jamshidi, and he ran our Raptors 905, our G League affiliate accounts for a while, and he did a great job. Um, and I knew that I wanted to separate a little bit more and focus on larger storytelling, um, you know, different specific content series with the team and the players. Um, and we elevated him up uh, into that role that I had uh, occupied the last time that we were talking. So uh, we have a strong team of two. Um, Love it. Added. Uh, one more, a strategist. Uh, I know you're a strategist. Nice. I have no idea what a strategist is. I don't know what I do. Yeah. Exactly. Still, still figuring that out. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, here we are today. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it's super interesting because, like, I, I, I would like to, to go on record and say that uh, the Raptors social is, is probably the, the best uh, sports franchise, Canadian sports franchise social presence, um, although there's, there's many people up there. Um, there's a lot of ass kissing going on, right? There, there is a lot of ass kissing, but I'm, I'm just like, like as you know, like, like we all kind of do like our own creeping. We all have like our, our we call it like, like a swipe file where like you kind of like maybe you're you're saving something on Twitter. You see like a, a brand or a publisher on Instagram. And you're like, you know what? I like that they just did that. I'm gonna keep it for, uh, you know, like my go-to uh, session later with my own team. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that you guys churn out is like constantly. On, on my swipe file, and it's on, I'm sure it's on uh, other people's too, and that journey to, to establish like the Raptors social presence, it must have been like a journey. So what, what, what was like, walk me a little no, bit through what it was aside. like. I appreciate that. I yeah. think that that's, that's one thing um, that probably goes unnoticed a lot is you don't get a lot of recognition um, for the work that you put into it. Yeah. Um, a lot is goes behind the scenes and, and, and things that, that uh, need to go into actually getting all the content out that you want to. Um, so, I mean, I was just lost at your compliment. What, what was your question? Like, let, let's, we're, we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're setting the stage, sure, right? Sure, we're, we're We're kicking off yeah. with, like, where we've been, where we are now, where we're moving towards. What was, what was, uh, what was the past like for you and the journey just creating what is now like the Raptor social presence? Oof. I mean, I have a little bit of a different philosophy than some. I mean, working like 
like a team direct. Yeah. Um, a lot, very different from then running like a brand social. Um, because there's a lot of human element to it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of different stories, but at the same time, you, you're pretty much a news outlet 24 seven. So anything that happens with the Toronto Raptors, um, that news needs to be communicated to people, right? And then pretty much how we can influence that is how do we shape that, how do we tell it? Um, so I think early on, you know, we were taking grainy cell phone pictures yeah. uh, and putting really brutal Instagram filters on stuff. And now, you know, we're, we're growing, we're getting there. Yeah. And, you know, we're purchasing grown-up equipment. And nice. uh, we're evolving with the times. We're trying to keep up because, uh, man, social media, that, that thing, if you, don't, uh, if you don't keep up, you'll, be, you'll get left behind real quickly. So l let's, let's talk about that, that, like, reactive environment for a moment. I, I feel... Copy you real quick. Yeah, please, yeah. please. We're in sync now. Yeah. Um, sports publisher. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very, like you're saying, very different than just being a more of a, like a traditional advertiser. Um, probably one of the biggest differences is that like you cannot um, uh, really plan for everything in advance. You can't really be as proactive as an advertiser would. Everything is is sort of popping up on uh, on you spontaneously. Everything's ad hoc. Like how how do you guys go through those motions where you prepare to have this like agile? Newsroom, let's call it. Yeah. But still, make sure to have your your own like brand agenda. Uh, well, that's that's kind of how I toe the line of keeping my job and almost getting fired every day, because I think everyone and probably I don't know all the other panels with people that have spoken here, but like, you know, you, you'll hear a lot about content calendars and strategy, yeah. and and I'm just not of that ilk in the sense that my focus is very much on. Um, what that content is and what that message is um, and honing in on making sure that that fits with who we are as a brand and, not, and more so who, who we are as a person. So one thing that I always say is if you get into social media, if you run an account, um, the worst thing you could do is just try to be someone that you're not like as a person, right? So if I'm a 30 some odd year old, I'm not gonna give you my age, my 30 some year old old man and I'm trying to act like I'm a 21 year old kid yeah. Um, who likes things that are popular, then I'm going to come off inauthentic, right? So I have to run it, I have to speak it with it how I am. So that's also a reason why over time you have to, you know, react. And so, you know, hiring a younger kid um, who's more of the traditional Toronto man's mm. and says a whole bunch of stuff that I have no idea what he's saying, but I just have to, like, cross my fingers that I don't get called in and fired the next day. Um, but, yeah, like, you just have to change a lot. So... Now, while there is a larger strategy and you, do, you know you have uh, like a tentpole events throughout the year that you yeah. have to plan for, so like there's, you know, we link up with the, with the Raptors marketing brand a lot to make sure that we can communicate the, you know, what we're trying to in the best way possible. But like we, we were talking backstage, like we operate on a 24 hour news cycle and the moment something happens, if you don't react or you don't get the content out that you need fast enough, mm -hmm. then it's old news mm -hmm. and you've, you've lost it and you've, you've fallen behind. So I think uh, it, more, more resources and more manpower obviously helps because you can be reactive. Um, so if you don't necessarily have that, and I mean a lot of the NBA teams are different, some have staffs of 10 to 15 full-time dedicated you know, digital people. Uh, uh, we, we're, we're much smaller, but what we do is we try to be as efficient as we can with our time, and, and we just hustle, that's all. You were talking before about like how, how challenging it can be to establish like the, the personality, the tone of a brand. Like you want, you want to, um, ultimately, the person who is, who is owning that voice, you want to make sure like there's a strong connection um, of understanding between the two. How, how did you guys go about creating the, whatever, you, let's call it personality, the tonality mm -hmm. of, uh, the Raptor social voice. I mean, that just goes into hiring. Yeah. I think like that, that probably is something that brands should really focus on is if you're trying to achieve a certain voice or, you know, if you want to be funny, if you want your account to be very like stats driven, you really have to make sure that you hire the right person as opposed to just go out and hire someone who has an impressive resume and then hope that they fit the mold. Because ultimately, again, they're, they, they, they know, like you know what you know, right? So. I'm going, only going to speak um, in references that are familiar to me. So therefore, we hire someone who represents um, Toronto, who's a you know a kid in and around the GTA, who mm -hmm. likes basketball and 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 
kind of fits the culture that is who the Toronto Raptors are, right? So um, it really does come down to that part, like where you just have to make sure at the very start that you focus in on getting the right people, mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of just mold and shape uh, as you go along. Totally. Um, you want to switch to last year? I feel like that's why everyone bought a ticket for this. Uh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they thought it was NAV, and then they're like, oh, no, it's yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> um, Walk, walk me through how how the beginning of the last year's season went. I mean, I think we all know it was uh, it was it was kind of special. But um, do, do you remember like what what uh, you know? You, there was a lot of like new faces on the roster. There was a, a lot of a lot of swagger and a confidence going into the season. What was the mandate from like a, the, the marketing and and social perspective? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, the pressure, uh, the expectations. Let's like rewind it back and listen. I have no problem making fun of myself. Um, and that's like a big part of also running social because listen, when you're, when you have the keys to an account that could be viewed by millions of people, um, anything and anything you say can be, you know, read into, misinterpreted and analyzed. Um, so you have to be very careful yeah. and you're, you're going to mess up. Um, as I told you a couple years ago, I'll, I'll bring that back up. I've sworn on the official Raptors account more than once. <laughs> so the fact that I'm still here talking to you today is I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm it's doing the beard, something. That's maybe why. it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've shaved my head and yeah. make them think that I'm someone else. Um, but it, like rewind it back from last year, we had like an extremely awkward situation um, that's never happened before. And we went out with something that we got killed online for um, just because... We didn't have enough people probably chiming in on it, and we had to turn something around quickly, but we were faced with firing the coach of the year. And we had to, we were, we had to put something out to communicate that Dwayne Casey had been acknowledged as the coach of the year directly after firing him. And <laughs> we're like, how do we do that? Because if you don't put something out, then you look like an asshole. Sorry. Um, but if you do then you look like you're tone deaf because you're like, oh, cool, yeah, congratulate the guy that you just canned. Um, so we got killed for it, but you learn and you go on. And then you trade away <laughs> one of your most beloved stars uh, that is really in tune, it, like a guy that, um, and DeMar DeRozan is the best. Um, and don't think for one second that his love for Toronto um, is, is a, a farce or is a, is a kind of a, a thing that he puts on. He really, truly loved the city and he loved the fans, he loved the people, and he was a great guy. Um, but that's just the business, a harsh reality in business of sports. So when we, when we initially traded him uh, for Kawhi Leonard, who had, you know, had sat out for a year, and who's a, I mean, listen, we all know how good Kawhi Leonard is, but it pissed a lot of people off. And when you're running an account, they're, you feel like they're pissed off at you, right? So anything that they say poorly, it's like directed at you. It's like a common thread now with like social media sports is like the accounts actually reminding people like, hey, I'm just like a guy that works at 50 Bay. Like I'm, I'm not Masai Ujiri. I didn't just trade the guy, right? Like, <laughs> but like seriously, like they, anything that you put out, they assume that that's a message that's like endorsed by Masai Ujiri, um, uh, Dwayne Casey, uh, DeMar DeRose, and any single player, right? So. Uh, difficult navigating that path that early part of the season. Kawhi Leonard. Um, also very difficult having a guy who's very like outgoing in a sense and loves Toronto and, and participates in everything to a guy who uh, doesn't smile ever. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, to answer a question you're probably going to ask me is we were very strategic in stuff that we put about with Kawhi Leonard. We wouldn't put out anything where he wasn't smiling because all of a sudden you put something out like that, everyone jumps on you and says, he's not happy. Look at him. He hates Toronto. It sucks. It snows too much. Right? It's just a picture. Like, so the, the, like the few moments when we captured him and he actually did smile, it was like a, you know, a mini celebration, and we banked a lot of content over the years yeah. uh, or over the year and, and, and put it out. And I mean, it's an... It, Listen, we shape the narrative, sure. Yeah. Were we painting a false picture of him? Not necessarily, but we're being very careful as to the message that was communicated. So early on, that coaching change and that player change was, was a big, big challenge for us. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud of the team. I think we did a, a half-decent job of that. 
Um, and then after that, it was the pressure from front office and everyone to really like make him seem feel comfortable and praise him and give him all the love that he deserves because ultimately, if you think about it, that was probably also tied into the thinking of they thought, well, you know, that'll help him come back because they're also thinking, hey, we've got a year to convince this guy to come back to our team. And from all reports, from the start of the season to where it ended, and even though he did leave for L.A., uh, and their lucky team beat us last night, um, but he, he, like, at the end, you could see it. He was true. He, he was like, man, this place is something else. Like, it, people don't hear about it in the league. Players don't hear about it in the league. And you get here, you see the people, you see the support, you see that freaking parade. Like, it's tough to leave, man. Were you there? Uh, I was on a bus. You are on the bus, of course. I was on the bus. Obviously. I was jumping from bus to bus with okay. the guys. And I, mean, I know we're fast-forwarding to the end, but like, like that thing is... That, that memory and watching that and all the people, that, that's like etched in my brain for, for the rest of my life. That was one of the coolest things I think I've ever seen. So I, I want to like zoom in a little bit more about like more like the, the climax. Maybe, maybe it happened during the finals. Maybe it was, it was still during like the postseason. Um, I feel like uh, it, was the, it was the first postseason run where a lot of the media pickup was suddenly talking about how there was like a country on, on the Raptors' back, and it was, it was basically like, it's not just a city watching, it was a country watching. What point do you remember, if you can like pinpoint that moment where from like managing the social channels, managing like uh, the content <coughs> strategy, where you're like, like holy shit, like this is, this is something so much bigger this time? I mean, I think, you know, you always know we're, it plays a part into like the identity as it's grown over the years, right? Like early on, everyone, uh, we, you know, you, not necessarily you didn't have an inferiority complex, but you felt slighted all the time because um, national media would never pay attention to us. Um, you try to get as much exposure as you can. You felt you had players and content deserving of more praise than other outlets or other teams. Like case in point, um, we just uh, we just took it to LeBron James and the Lakers uh, two nights ago, yes. which felt real real good. Um, and then the next day, the ESPN. Uh, headline news piece that they published. Uh, the, the title was Anthony Davis scores 27 points and LeBron James gets another triple-double. And all the highlight pack was of the Lakers highlights. They lost, man. <laughs> like, we beat them. So there, there always is that, like, underlying thing of, like, being overlooked. And, I mean, listen, that, that, that was very strategically and successfully woven into the fabric in the mantra of We the North. That's how that came about. And that's how we identify and we roll with it. And, and, and when, you, you know, when you start to compete at the highest level, which we did last year, and I would even say the five-year stretch that I've been involved is we've been as consistently competitive as any other professional for, uh, sports organization. We just haven't gotten over the line. Yeah. We did it last year, and, then, and therefore they start adopting you know, all the nicknames, you know, our slogan, um, Everything that we've kind of worked so hard to supplant and, and to, to, to strategically put out a message, that it got picked up nationally, and it was about time. That's awesome. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions. I'm just I'm curious about the that one point about the Wiener North. Um, we might have already covered it, but I'm curious, like, how how do you guys approach like year after year translating the Wiener North platform into social? Like, does it is it just like pretty straightforward for you guys? Does it ha like change a little bit? Not necessarily. That's, that's something that's really uh, protected and managed from our brand team. I mean, uh, we, <laughs> we ended up calling out, uh, we ended up calling CBC fake news at the time in a playful manner. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was only because um, what, we, what we were doing is we were just having fun with the fact that when you change season over season, and sometimes campaigns change and you look to like push it to a different area and you look to try to communicate a different message. What we all knew at this time was everyone was like, oh, is We the North gone? And we're like, nah, it's not gone. Like it's always who we are because like I said, it was born off of an identity of, of being overlooked and then rallying together to kind of fight and, and be recognized and be valued as we think we should be. Totally. Cool. Um, let's open it up for a question or two. Anybody? Oh, we have a spotlight. Yeah. We can hear you. 
You can yell, right? <laughs> I wish I had my glasses. Uh, you touched on this briefly, talking about um, the game two nights ago, how it wasn't really represented in a way. I'm sure after we won, we were kind of everywhere. Do you feel like we are, I say we, like I feel like I'm one of you. <laughs> Listen, that's, we, that's we, we as Torontonians. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you feel that we are kind of now back at the bottom and, and we have to earn our way to the top every time? Or do you think we, we maybe are more in the middle now? We're like we, we're not at the bottom, but we're not yeah. at the top. And I, it's a great question. I think, uh, I think we're definitely not where we were, you know, pre We the North and pre this like sustained five, six year period of success. But I think we are where we're comfortable. Um, I think let people not talk about us and then jump on the bandwagon later because we know how good we are. Um, people picking the Raptors not finishing in the playoffs, like as ludicrous as that sounds. Like the year, for instance, last year we won the championship and they ranked the preseason ranked us fifth and had the Charlotte Hornets finishing above us. So anyone that you have to understand too that the people that are doing these rankings. They're, they're just people, they're not experts, they're not, they're not like within a team that's putting that out, right? They're just a talking head. And their biggest thing is they actually want controversy and that's, a, that's actually a weird, I'm going off on a tangent here, but that's like a weird switch with where, where social is going. It's like, you're almost now only popular if you say ludicrous things, right? You no. literally say really dumb things and you've, you're just inviting engagement. Um, so to really pay attention to that stuff, um, shouldn't matter, and it doesn't matter to our team, it doesn't matter to our management, it doesn't matter to our ownership. I mean, it matters, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to affect them. Anybody else? Yeah. Hello. A bit more of a practical question. Mm. Um, given you had to put out medium so quickly, and it's such, there's multiple levels of approval, I'm sure, is there any tools or processes that you had in place to manage all that? Um, coffee. Uh, <laughs> I used to make fun of my friend for drinking coffee. I was like, oh, you, well, you're cool, you drink coffee. And like, I have three coffees a day now. Um, no, I know. There's a lot of tools that can help you. Um, I don't, I'm not really one to, to I'm like not big on scheduling. Um, I very much like to react in the moment. And now that does take up probably a lot more time and maybe isn't as efficient as what you're thinking or what other brands do. But again, I really just wanna make sure that everything that goes out, <laughs> we see, we have eyes on because we've got millions, right? And, I, and just like the, the built up anxiety over years of, of like looking at something for like a good five minutes, making sure that it doesn't say something or mean something that's not. So that's why I'm not like a really big proponent of it, but I think it's useful in certain cases when you need to sleep more than three hours a day. <laughs> more? I feel weird being the guy who's like selects people to ask questions. <laughs> I wish it was you. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. Hello. Hey. So this question is actually out of curiosity. Um, you mentioned that you um, react in real time. Um, game seven against the 76ers, the mm. iconic buzzer beater shot. Mm. I think that was the first time that things got real for the city. How was that on social media and how did you react? How did you handle it? Um, so I got up, um, I screamed. <laughs> I th I'm not lying to you, I threw a chair across the room and then I chest bumped um, my community manager and he, and he fell down, or I fell down. And then I snapped out of it, and we both jumped right back on our computers, um, and we tried to get it out as fast as we could, um, and as much, and, and glorify it in as many different ways, video, imagery, uh, different angles, um, as much as we could, um, because, I mean, that, uh, for obvious reasons, I think was probably our top three most engaging pieces of content that we've ever had. Um, but I think after that fact, we, we capitalized on the moment, but then equally as important is we worked with like our in-house studio team um, and they created almost like a reimagination of the shot through, you know, a dark, un, like dark, um, unfilled stadium. We put out that piece of content. So we really 
try to do as much as we can to, to emphasize it. And again, to my earlier point, all that led up into like highlighting our players, showing how good Kawhi was, making sure people understood that that was a, a moment that deserved the amount of stuff that we, that we rolled out with. We have to wrap, I'm told. Boo. Um, but Matt is going to be right there for Am I? the rest of the evening okay. for Q&As. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Matt. Thank you, this guy right here. Thank you. Okay.